We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. We have um, an amazing panel with us today, connecting. We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We are all united. All right, let's start that again. My apologies, I forgot uh, that we are always starting the sessions with the IGF official introductory video. So um, starting again, uh, thank you for everybody who's joining us from um, around the world here in the room in Katowice or online. Um, good morning to those of you um, who have just waking up. Uh, good evening um, to those of you who are trying to bear with us at the last hours of your days. Um, as I said, my name is Timio Schütte um, and I work for the International Chamber of Commerce and I'm joined today by an amazing panel um, from around the world. Um, it's Norm, uh, Mr. Norm Barbosa from um, Microsoft, he's general manager and associate general counsel for lawful access and telecom. Mr. Michael DeSantis, a senior policy advisor, innovation, science, and economic development from the government of Canada. Mr. Lawrence McDonald, uh, privacy and public policy manager at Meta. Ms. Galia Daur, policy advisor um, in the SDI directorate of the OECD. Ms. Lee Tuthill, um, formerly with the WTO and now visiting fellow at the in Institute for International Trade of the University of Adelaide. And Mr. Joseph Withlock, um, a director uh, pol of policy at the Software Alliance BSA. I'm also joined by my colleague, uh, Georgiana Dejeratu, who will be moderating um, um, our online conversation and a rapporteur, Ben Wallace um, from Microsoft. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for being here with us. Um, I don't want to take up too much time uh, in introducing our session because I do want to make time for conversation with those of you in the room in person and virtually, and also um, for conversation with obviously our amazing panel. Just a few words um, for, um, for inter introduction. Um, what is this session about and, and why did we feel that it is important to uh, organize a session like this at the IGF? We hear a lot of conversations about data, data flows, um, um, why, why they are important, uh, that data is everywhere. Um, but just to put some numbers to this, this conversation, um, data transfers are estimated to contribute around $2.8 trillion to the global GDP. Uh, they sh this is a share that exceeds the global trade good in goods, and it is expected to grow to $11 trillion by 2025. And this is a value that is not only shared by um, the digital sector, technology companies, or telecommunication companies, it's shared by traditional industries like agriculture, logistics, manufacturing, with, um, which actually realize about 75% of the value of data transfers. And we've seen in the past years um, with the COVID pandemic how um, the, um, the resiliency of economies and the societal well-being is, is so much dependent now on these trusted and uninterrupted flows of data between countries. But nevertheless, um, while this, the data flows are so important, we are seeing um, both um, citizens, companies, and governments trust in international data flows and the technologies they enable dwindle and erode um, over increasing concerns uh, about security, about data protection, consumers' rights, universal human rights and freedoms, including privacy rights, um, and the lack of clarity, transparency, and consistency between national approaches to government access to data held by the private sector. These increased concerns reduced the distrust that we all put in digital technologies and may discourage um, citizens, the private sectors or governments um, participation into global digital economy. Um, 
And this can um, not only negatively impact economic growth, uh, but also our societal well-being. So this session really aims to understand the cause of and impacts of this mistrust um, and try to offer an opportunity for all of us to think together and explore um, potential solutions. Um, so and as, as I did now, um, I'm lining up uh, both the positives and the benefits of data and the challenges that we're facing. The session will do that too in two parts. First, I will turn to our panelists and ask them um, what is at stake here? How do they feel about data flows, their industries, their sectors? Um, how do they benefit? And then we will try and explore together in a conversation what the solutions might be. I also invite all of you who are following us um, in, in the chat rooms, both of you uh, here in Katowice and uh, in your um, own offices or rooms at home to use the chat um, while our um, panelists are speaking to share your experience um, and to pose your questions in the, um, uh, in the chat as well, which we will be moderating. So with, without further ado, I will be turning to our first speaker uh, and I will ask uh, Ms. Galia Daor from the OECD to give us sort of an introductory discussion on the role of data for, for growth and well-being um, and to uh, share with us a little bit what are the OECD's broader policy objectives to help both governments um, and society at large to harness this potential of data. Galia, please, over to you. Thank you very much, Timea, and I'm very excited to be part of this panel today and, and sort of part of this really important conversation. Um, so just like you said, maybe to sort of kickstart our, our discussion, I know some of the other panelists will sort of elaborate more on, on some of these points, but to give the overview of what the OECD sees as the role of data for, for growth and well-being. Um, so I think, and, and, and that was sort of really clear in, in your introduction, but I think it's, it's, it's obvious to all of us that sort of the data economy is the economy now. Um, there is no sort of business operation there without, without data or without data flows. Um, it's, it's essential to, to the uh, delivery of public services. It's critical to innovation. And over the past two years, for sure, uh, with, with the COVID pandemic, um, we've seen that sort of the, 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 the flow of data and in particular the international flow of data um, was essential to our ability to um, interact with other people, to continue working, uh, to continue uh, learning, to access healthcare, um, and was also uh, an important part of uh, initiatives to, um, to fight the pandemic itself, sort of in, in tracking and tracing of, of contact cases, and of course, in, in developing a, a vaccine uh, and treatments. Um, so, so I think I think sort of the, the, the importance of, of cross-border data flows is, is, is cannot be overstated. Um, and I think another another um, important aspect of, of this conversation is the technological developments that sort of underpin it. So, if we look at uh, artificial intelligence or uh, the Internet of Things, uh, obviously the cloud, uh, these things sort of have enabled uh, and. and uh, uh, a faster and cheaper um, collection and storage and processing of data that allows uh, all of us sort of individuals, businesses, governments to, to make the most of this important resource. Um, but I, I think the critical point, um, and I think is the, the heart of our discussion, um, is that we cannot make the most of, of this of, of data without being able to access it and share it. Um, and, and the access and sharing of data also raised these, these important questions that you alluded to um, of the, the real and perceived risks to privacy, to security, competition, intellectual property rights, um, bias, um, and, and sort of important questions around the, the right incentives or the way to incentivize the, the right way to, to access and share data. And so uh, from the OECD's perspective, um, over this and, and the next year, we are we have undertaken a cross-cutting project on data governance for growth and well-being uh, that has essentially two parts. Uh, one is to improve our understanding of data, um, and and for that we can think of sort of at least three elements. Uh, one is the the use of data to drive growth and well-being in different sectors, uh, like the ones that I mentioned before, sort of health and education and energy, um, agriculture. Um, a second element is to have a more nuanced understanding of data, because uh, I think the conversation around data tends to focus on personal data uh, that raises important questions, but a lot of the value that comes from data uh, has to do with non-personal data 
uh, if we look at specific industries like agriculture, for example. Uh, and this raises a different set of questions uh, around the, 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 the flows of, of, of non-personal data. Um, and, and the third element is perhaps the, the measurement. So you mentioned uh, the, the important sort of the, the numbers that you mentioned about contribution to GDP, but I think uh, we all understand that it's, it's really hard to put specific numbers on the value of data because it's so context dependent. It so depends on, on when and, and what other data you have and what you do with it. So, so it's very hard to sort of give numbers to, to measure its value. And then the second part of this project is really the, the heart of the policy discussion is our support to governments uh, in developing uh, or revising their data governance policies and strategies so that they can help themselves and their businesses and their citizens uh, navigate through the trade-offs of, of data governance and sort of bring value and growth and well-being uh, to all of us. I'll stop here and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I need to make sure I know which mic to mute and unmute when I'm uh, both virtual and in the room, but uh, I hope I will do better by the end of this session. Uh, so thank you very much for that, Galia. Uh, it was a great way uh, of introducing the topic um, and posed uh, the, the most pressing questions uh, I don't, from what is data and, and how are we uh, measuring that. Uh, I think that is the first thing that we need to um, think about um, when, um, when we try and find the right policies around this. Um, I'm turning over now to, to Joe, um, Joe Withlock from the BSA. Uh, we've heard um, Galia mention uh, the OECD's efforts around uh, policy making by governments. I'm just wondering how do you see the role of data flows to support um, the private sector, the business processes and the innovation uh, in, within the private sector, and how are businesses of various sizes benefiting from, um, from data flows? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so the ability to transfer data securely and responsibly across transnational IT networks is critical to many economic and social benefits. Data transfers support COVID-19 recovery. Uh, they support economic development around the world, digital connectivity, cybersecurity, fraud prevention, uh, anti-money laundering, anti-terrorist financing, and many other activities that are related to health privacy, security, and regulatory compliance. But beyond that, data transfers also support global supply chains, uh, an issue of prominence today, uh, innovation, productivity, environmental responsibility in every sector of the economy. 75% of the value of data transfers is um, estimated to benefit sectors such as logistics, manufacturing, and agriculture. So we've seen, um, a great deal of evidence around this, and much of that evidence has been produced by the OECD, um, but a number of other WTO and a number of other organizations as well. Um, perhaps related there to we're seeing a great deal of negotiating activity among countries in this space. So just in the last month alone, I think today we saw an announcement that the UK and Singapore have concluded their agreement in principle on a, on a digital economy agreement. Uh, yesterday, the United States and the UK announced a number of data transfer initiatives uh, bilaterally. In the last month, we've seen an announcement of an Indo-Pacific economic framework with a, a focus on uh, that it would include a digital form of data transfers by the United States. Singapore and the EU are expected to announce a digital economy agreement. Um, why is all of this negotiating activity occurring? Um, it's occurring in part, and, and I should not leave out the WTO and a number of other longstanding uh, negotiating initiatives, but it's occurring in part because of the growth of, of what we see as data nationalism around the world. And that's essentially the view that all data generated in a particular country must remain within that country. Um, if we see those types of measures sort of proliferate around the world, it could be incredibly damaging to the, the policy objectives and the governmental objectives that I outlined at the outset. Just to give one clear example, we would not have a COVID vaccine today if it weren't for the ability to transfer data. And the last comment I'll just make, um, and perhaps previewing other comments, um, is, is that you know, we do have a number of um, 
international regulatory frameworks that we can draw upon to, to think about how do we balance um, the interest in preserving and safeguarding secure and responsible data transfers with the, the right to regulate, with the governmental right to regulate. I think one good place to look is at WTO norms. Uh, the flow of goods across borders, the flow of services across borders and investment across borders, those flows, international flows, are all subject to um, a number of safeguards that balance the interest in commerce and the interests um, of, of the right of governments to regulate. Um, and those safeguards include uh, ensuring that, um, number one, that there's a presumption uh, in favor of, of, of international trade uh, or the international flow. Um, and on the other hand, uh, recognizing that governments have the right to regulate when necessary. And when they do so, they should regulate in a way that's non-discriminatory, that's transparent, um, and consistent with good regulatory practices. So um, I'll pause there and, and look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Joe. And that was the greatest segue that I could have asked for to turn to our next speaker, um, Lee Tatil. Um, Lee, you have uh, an amazingly long and, and productive experience with, with trade discussions. Um, what do you think about um, uh, this question that, that Joe has primed for us? Are, are barriers to, to data flows uh, trade barriers? And, and how do you see the connection between the two? Oh, well, let me let me back up a minute, um, because I think that in WTO and, and my area was services, particularly ICT services. And I think since the 1980s, when we observed that at least initially uh, industrialized economies were becoming very uh, services oriented, um, and now many, many economies are, are heavily services oriented, I think we realized from the beginning and our negotiations years ago on services trade that, that services were highly information dependent. So even in the early days, we did create some rules dealing with um, uh, movement of information and the access to the infrastructure to move information through ICT networks. Um, so I think that's been long in coming um, what we're seeing today is people wondering, what more do we need? Do we have enough? As, as everything has essentially gone online. Um, information intensive for decades have been sectors like financial services, uh, tourism, and another, a lot of knowledge, knowledge services, ICT. I mean, years and years ago, I got a phone call from a um, computer services company saying, listen, We've started uh, supplying our, our, our software online uh, and those days as email attachments to customers. And uh, what should we do? We're not trying to evade you know, duties. Um, you know, uh, how can we defend ourselves if a government accuses of, us of evading duties? So that was a concern even before the current discussions on digital trade and everything. You have, um, you have the, Infrastructure level uh, that deals with the 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 um, um, data flows very much. Of course, the telecom and ICT are the, are the are the the transit tubes for this. The logistics sectors, which is an infrastructure uh, very much for goods, has been highly uh, data flows intensive uh, uh, for a very long time. Initially, using satellites before internet technologies were available, and still using satellite networks to some degree. And more recently, the on online distribution services channels. I mean, all of these need not only domestic uh, connectivity and domestic data flows to operate smoothly, but international ones as well. Um, you have you have the marketing platforms and and the the uh, telecom and the logistics are by definition global. Even tourism that I mentioned and financial have long been global industries. So as they went digital and, and they started uh, you know, moving more and more information around the world, uh, clearly it was going to be a problem uh, if barriers started to come into play. Now, I think that when you speak of barriers, um, oh, just the benefits, I think, are very interesting because you could see in the example of the tourism industry, huge cost savings 
uh, uh, affecting their bottom line and, and much greater efficiency in tourism and many other sectors that began to use global data flows to manage their, their business and trade. And companies and, and industries that were less global before could so much more easily go global. Now, the barriers, um, and I know it was interesting to see the previous speaker cut it in, in a certain way. I'm cutting it uh, in a slightly different way. The layers of data flows have to do, one, with the infrastructure, two, with what is really a huge back office function of data flows um, in terms of what makes a company work, and finally, the content level. And I think that different solutions need to be looked at for those different layers. In many respects, people do not, would not like to see the infrastructure layer interfered with. And that's really where things like data localization as a trade barrier hit the most in terms of the way the internet actually works and not allowing it to work as it would. I think that there's a lot of concern about loss of national jurisdictions. Um, and, and, and that governments are concerned and maybe overreact. On the other hand, you have, um, you have governments that uh, are a little concerned that the bad actors are getting away with things. Now, I think the days when we thought of internet as, as, as a utopia where everyone would be informed, everyone would be able to contact everyone and it would all be a very nice place, that, that's been proved wrong. And we've had to realize you can't have the Wild West uh, anymore for and, de and total uh, unregulated sector. But uh, I think that the solutions for how to deal with the bad actors, and that goes far beyond privacy, I would agree that it, that it also includes uh, things like fraud uh, and things like uh, hacking. Uh, and, and a lot of misinformation is probably one of the more recent issues that all need to be dealt with in a way that doesn't interfere with the benefits, or at least to a minimum degree uh, would not interfere uh, with the benefits. So I think that, that that is something about trade barriers, depending on the layer, trade barriers, depending on the sector uh, can, can affect data. Um, but uh, I think we've got to have the regulators in particular talking to one another. And I think we'll get back to that in the next panel. We thank will you. indeed. Thank, thank you very much, Lee. Um, that's quite a, a quite an impressive list for all of us to reflect upon, and we're only halfway through the panel, um, so we will still um, have a couple of questions to explore before we turn to the solutions. I hope we don't um, depress everybody <laughs> with some of the challenging problems uh, that we're identifying over here. Um, Norm, I, I want to talk to you a little bit, and we've heard from uh, from Galia about. Um, the various types of data that we need to consider. We've, we've heard from Joe around the importance of non-discriminatory regulation and, and trade. Um, Lee, uh, from a, a number of perspectives around data infrastructure processes and, um, and content, uh, but we haven't discussed security. Um, so I, I hope you can enlighten us um, a little bit around that. Uh, we have a number of um, ideas around how security, data security and data protection is important. Um, uh, but can we um, use data and data flows in our efforts to strengthen security? Does it work the other way around as well? Thank you, Tamia. Um, I, I was very excited to be part of this panel and thank you for um, allowing me to participate. Also excited to see Galia and, and the others here. Uh, Microsoft has, has been very active with business um, and providing input to the OECD discussion of uh, trusted government access to data. And, and as the other speakers have highlighted, there's, there's so many incredibly important benefits to global data flows. And, and we, uh, as industry, we have an interest in, in all of those various benefits, both for our own business interests, but more importantly, for the interests of, of our customers who include at, at this point, not just consumers using the internet for recreation, but, but increasingly um, over the last 10 years, global businesses and governments who are seeking to use digital transformation. So we see this is incredibly important. I did want to focus on, on one of the areas uh, of benefits that come out of global data flows that I don't think has received significant enough attention in, in light of the, the pressures against global data flows. And, and that really is cybersecurity. 
Um, we, we recently issued our digital defense report, which is a, a report we've been uh, cultivating over the last couple of years to try and focus on the cybersecurity threats that we see at Microsoft, both um, and through our own work with our customers, as well as with, in collaboration with governments and, and others in industry around the world. And if you've reviewed any of that report or, or, or many of the other reports about cybersecurity, the threats from malicious actors are not going away. They, they are increasing. We see increasing sophistication in those threats, both from uh, criminal actors as well as malicious nation states seeking to, to gain access to the private communications of our customers through the use of, of hacking and, and, and vulnerabilities. Um, two of the most significant attacks in, in recent history, the solar winds attacks and the hafnium attacks were a, a prominent part of our uh, of our report. But we also noted that, that we filed or we provided over 20,000 notifications to our customers around the world that they had been targeted or compromised by malicious nation state actors in just, in just the last year. And so we see that as such an important uh, problem to tackle. And one of the ways we tackle that is through our analysis of, of global data sets, the flow of data globally, um, our ability to have teams that are globally distributed to, to look at those threats and correlate threats from different regions of the world and, and hopefully identify them early. That was critical to um, our participation in the solar winds investigation, our ability to see um, those vulnerabilities being used to attack our customers, not just in the United States, but, but in Europe and other parts of the world were incredibly important to the effectiveness of, of our information sharing, both with governments as, as well as with others in industry. And as we, we look at these pressures that are coming uh, to limit global data flows that are coming out of fear and uncertainty over lawful access to data. Lawful access to data primarily from governments uh, governed by the rule of law and with democracy, but with a lack of enough transparency and enough certainty about what those rules. The concern that we have is that this fear, this fear of illusory threats from lawful access to data is overcoming a very known and quantifiable threat of unlawful access to data by malicious actors. Um, and so we're looking for ways to ensure that as we, as we develop norms and rules to govern lawful access, we don't impose restrictions on data on global data flows that harm our ability to, to protect our customers globally uh, from cybersecurity threats which present effectively the other side of the coin. Unlawful access versus lawful access is two sides of the same coin. Both of them have a cost on privacy and security. And as we've seen uh, recently with the rise in nation state attacks and malicious criminal activity, uh, those threats are, 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 like, are arguably much greater to the security and privacy of our customers' data and, and data uh, globally. Thank you very much, Norm. That was a very clear explanation of really what's at stake here um, and what um, regulators um, and, and, and the multi-stakeholder community needs to be aware of when we're thinking about um, data flows and, uh, and protecting uh, our data. Um, and, and this is also something that I want to ask Lawrence about. Um, Norm has mentioned uh, conversations around uh, privacy and, and, and data protection. Um, so I, I'd like to hear also your perspective a little bit um, uh, about uh, how the effects of privacy um, concerns um, uh, impact the, the, our trust and data flows. How do um, varying standards and approaches to, to security and privacy um, uh, impact uh, us uh, impact data flows. Um. Yeah, um, so first I'd like to thank the organizers for setting up this panel and for um, giving me the opportunity to speak here um, today at this really important session. Um, I'd like to start off by also echoing a lot of my fellow panelists here today who've talked about the importance of the free flow of data for economic opportunity, um, the importance of it um, for, for, for best security practices. Um, those are very important for us here at Meta. Um, also, I'd like to highlight another point that I don't think has been touched on yet, which is the human rights importance. We've kind of talked about with access to information, but uh, it's the free flow of data is critical for uh, access to information, privacy, 
freedom, uh, freedom of expression and opinion um, and enables communities to safeguard those rights and hold violators accountable. Um, it's, it's very important. Um, and all this depends on approach to internet governance that protects the free flow of data um, with trust and the ability to send communications with the knowledge that they'll be private and secure. Um, a lot of the, the panels here have also talked about um, how there, there are many governments that are attempting to find regulations for the internet for the first time, um, which is very positive. However, the increase in the narrative such as in, 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 in things such as data sovereignty um, have increased um, regulations that undermine many of the, um, the, the issues that they're trying to resolve. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of uh, regulations um, and data localization um, that undermine privacy, security, um, economic opportunity, and have serious uh, human rights implications. Um, so they also uh, risk balkanizing the internet into regional and local silos, um, which threaten the technical nature that is necessary for the internet to function. Um, because of how the internet was built and how it's evolved, um, any kind of communication, any kind of data flow, it's in just the way it's it's made, uh, it's it's sent all over the world. So, you know, we're all joined here. I'm in New York and many of you are in different parts of the world. And if this communication, through this communication, this data flows that happen, um, it could be going from anywhere to South Korea, to Japan, to to parts of Africa, um, to to increase uh, the, 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 the quickest route. Um, and make sure that um, they're, they're flowing with trust and security. Um, so uh, the balkanization of the internet is, is, is very threatening, um, not only for a regulatory stance, but for a human rights perspective, for a securities best practices perspective, um, for an economic perspective. Um, and rather than developing regulations that, that threaten the open and secure internet by restricting or prohibiting uh, data transfers, we should build frameworks that promote cross-border data transfers and protect users' privacy um, and fundamental rights. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. It's really um, an, an important um, bit, I think, that, that you touched on, touched on there is really on how does the internet work and, and how data flows really underpin um, a, a communication like this one uh, or just a simple um, sending of an email that we take take for granted um, uh, already here. Um, and, and when we think about um, sometimes uh, these important questions, we, we miss that connection uh, of how the internet is set up and how it works. Um, and we only think about, um, going back to what Lee was talking about, the different layers of the internet, we think about the content that is that is moving uh, on top of all these layers, but we do need to think about this in a holistic, holistic way. Um, and of course, uh, turning um, to Michael, um, our last panelist, um, it's, it's not an easy, easy feat on, on, on the governments um, who ultimately uh, take the regulatory decisions uh, on how you balance uh, the policy objectives of, of what we've heard around growth, competitiveness, economic uh, benefits, innovation, with, with conversations around um, and concerns of users around privacy, um, consumer protections, human rights protections. Um, do you see this as a, as a zero sum game? Uh, is, is this a question of either or, or, or how, how, how do governments approach making policy uh, around these issues? Michael, over to you. So thanks very much for your question and thanks for inviting me to the panel. Uh, I would say from a Canadian perspective, uh, I'd argue that innovation and growth are actually assisted and not hindered by improved data security and privacy protection. Uh, so Canada recognizes that sound privacy and data protection practices are increasingly becoming a competitive advantage in the digital economy and that trust drives growth. Uh, in Canada, we benefit from a strong and flexible privacy regime that establishes a pretty effective balance between the needs for uh, businesses for information and also while respecting the privacy rights of individuals. So at the federal level, we have the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act, or PIPIDA, and that's Canada's federal private sector privacy law that would apply in the context of commercial activity. Uh, so based on international principles such as meaningful consent, transparency, accountability, PIPIDA balances individual privacy with the legitimate needs of businesses. And PIPIDA is also a key element of Canada's strategy to protect and promote the online marketplace. 
It's unique in the way that it per, uh, permits cross-border data flows. So PIPIDA does not prohibit organizations from transferring personal data to an organization outside of Canada for processing. However, it does require organizations uh, remain accountable for that information that they transfer by keeping it under their control. PIPIDA's cross-border data regime considers two things that must be respected prior to the transfer, and those are consent and accountability. A company that's disclosing personal information across the border, including for processing, must obtain consent from the individual. And the form of the consent sort of depends on the sensitivity of the information at issue and the individual's reasonable expectations in the circumstances. Accountability in the same context uh, means that when disclosing personal information to a third party for processing, a company does not relinquish control of the information. And what that means is regardless of where the information is being processed, whether it's in Canada or somewhere else in the world, the organization must take all reasonable steps to protect it from unauthorized uses and disclosures while it's in the hands of a third party processor. And this is usually sort of by means of contract. Uh, so I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the EU's uh, general data protection regulation. Under the GDPR, personal information can only flow across borders if specific conditions are met by the controller and the processor. And just generally, those are uh, an adequate level of protection in the legal regime in the country of transfer, so adequacy, or other safeguards like binding corporate rules, contractual clauses between parties, certification schemes, things like that. I think that PIPIT is actually uh, an interesting contrast to the GDPR uh, for cross-border data rules because it's less formal and it's more flexible. And that uh, lack of formality and flexibility makes growth and innovation easier for firms that don't want to operate in Canada. Uh, at the same time, though, I would argue that PIPIT empowers individuals to retain a degree of control over their personal information after it's collected. And this control persists even if their data is transferred uh, across an international border. So I think it presents an interesting case for people to consider. But that's all I have to say about that. And thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, I'm sure that you will have um, more to say <laughs> about, about that and other processes as well. Um, uh, and, and I hope we can all um, contribute to, to, to that, as, that discussion. Um, it's, it's not an easy uh, conversation that we put on the table um, today for, for everyone to, to contribute to and, and ask um, solutions um, for. Um, we've shared a couple of examples uh, of the roles of data. We've also shared a couple of um, barriers that, um, that um, our speakers have identified that we need to um, think about when um, we're looking at enhancing trust in, in data flows. Um, so before I turn back to the speakers and, and ask them about solutions going forward, I want to turn a little bit to the audience for, for just a few minutes here. Um, and see if there are any examples, um, ideas from your, um, your round of work, your sector that you are involved in, your organization, on how, how you see data flows um, assisting you in the daily uh, jobs that you do in, in your activities, um, or what are the challenges that you face. Um, so um, I'll turn to the chat first, um, but I also am looking at the audience here in the room. Uh, if you can just put your hand up if you'd like to contribute. Um, my, you can come up to the microphone here um, at the corner of the table and, um, and ask your question or contribute. Um, and just turning to the chat, I see um, Ahmed having a question um, and I will ask uh, one of the panelists to, feel, to volunteer to answer. Um, so Ahmed is asking, uh, what are the panel's thoughts on ensuring shared prosperity and equitable gains from cross-border data flows, especially for Africa? Um, given the global data related divide, this is emerging, um, big tech dominance and geopolitical influence that AI techno nationalists um, have in the current data economy. So how do we um, share prosperity and the benefits of data across um, the various parts of the world? Would anybody like to venture to take that question? Norm, please. I'll jump. I'll jump in. <clears throat> um, I think that's a very good question. We we are actively working in a number of jurisdictions, including Africa, to 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 work towards greater sharing of those benefits uh, throughout the world. And and I think the development of data centers and the expansion of of operations of not just the global giants like my company and and some of the others that are represented on this panel. 
um, is going to be very important to, to share in the benefits in, in other parts of the world, including Africa. That's great to hear. I'm sure our, our speaker uh, or the, the person who asked our question is, is, is reassured by, by your efforts. Um, would anybody else like to chime in on, on that topic? Thank you, Timmy. I'd like to just add a comment as well. I think it's a, it's a great question and a very important issue to address. Um, one, one resource that's, that's a very useful resource um, on this is a recent UNCTAD report on uh, cross-border data flows. Uh, and then last year, the World Bank issued a report on data for development. Both of those are, are excellent, uh, comprehensive reviews uh, of the types of questions posed. Um, just to take an excerpt from the UNCTAD report, um, UNCTAD noted that divergent data nationalism, uh, this, this broad issue that, that we've referred to, um, is threatening to the, the, the interests of kind of a coll collective interest, but the interests of developing countries in particular, um, in so much as it will lead to suboptimal domestic regulations, reduces market opportunities for MSMEs, um, reduces opportunities for information and data sharing specifically. Um, so the, the, to the extent that data regulation is focused on restricting the transfers, um, th that type of regulation um, at the front end seems, seems uh, counterproductive and harmful. Uh, but there's much more that uh, countries around the world can do uh, to help with uh, cross-border access to data. And, and one of the things that I think is worth noting, and it's a fair criticism of, of a number of countries that have focused on digital economy agreements, those agreements, if you look at the United States, for example, the United States has made uh, commitments to guarantee access, cross-border access to, to data and uh, data transfers with Mexico, with Canada, and with Japan, right? And the United States negotiated those commitments in the TPP as well. But we don't see those commitments having been negotiated with other, other countries around the world. And we would certainly welcome, you know, a more active US, from, from the US perspective, a more active US negotiating position in engaging in these types of negotiations with Kenya and with, with other countries around the world. Thank you, Joe. Um, I see Galia and Lee, your hands are up as well. So uh, Galia first and then, and then Lee, please. Uh, I'm assuming you're both um, adding into Ahmed's question. Um, yes, thanks. Maybe just to sort of add a, a quick comment from, from my side uh, for, for the OECD, um, which obviously works on, on sort of the development context more broadly. Um, so in fact, it, it, by the end of sort of in a few weeks or maybe early January, we'll come out with a report, our sort of flagship development cooperation report, uh, which will focus on the digital transformation of, of in developing countries. And I think one thing that we see is sort of the challenges are similar but different uh, between developing and, and, and developed countries. But I think uh, sort of a strong emphasis on access um, and a strong emphasis on skills uh, are, are really important. And, and sort of another thing is maybe to, to have a, the international forum for conversation. So um, the OECD is, is one place and, and there are others, but just to have sort of countries, the different countries and, and the different voices uh, represented. Thank you. Thank you very much, Galia. Uh, Lee, please go ahead. Yeah, just briefly, um, I think that Joe addressed my concerns about digital nationalism already. Uh, so I would just say that it, it can come out as protectionist and anti-trade and in that respect would hurt everybody in the global economy and, and all the traders. Um, in respect to uh, succeeding in the digital uh, space, I think that it, it's a misperception that you're going to have to be big or you're going to have to be one of the global uh, winners to, for it to make a difference. Um, I think in small economies and for small companies, uh, the, the digitization and, and the, the use of data can have a huge impact. It is not going to put any particular company or country perhaps in, in the top 10 lists that we constantly see. Uh, but you can make a difference for some uh, suppliers in Africa between making an income that sends their kids to school or or, or not, and, and that's a huge, huge impact uh, for a country's economy. I think what's uh, the, the concern for the divide is, is not so much who's big and who's not, 
but that you, you may well have uh, for those people who want to trade and do international business in developing countries, you may have a, a higher incidence of, of connectivity uh, within the capital. You may have a higher incidence of connectivity amongst businesses than you might have amongst ordinary citizens. And that helps them get a leg up. But again, you know, you do need the skills uh, development uh, to make that work as well. Thanks. Thank you, Lee. Um, and I want to thank um, the participants in the chat as well for the, for the great questions and moving this discussion along um, uh, and helping me as, as the moderator. Um, um, I, I actually wanted to ask questions to guide us towards um, solutions um, and, and what brings us, brings us forward from here. Um, so I, I'm very glad that, that you, are, you are thinking of the same questions um, over here. Um, I see a hand in the room as well. So um, please, if you could just introduce yourself and ask your question. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Jacques Beglinger. I'm co-secretary of the Swiss IGF. And I just wanted to share with you briefly, well, a rather positive um, uh, uh, discussion that, uh, or the outcome of a positive discussion we had at the recent uh, local IGF. And uh, in particular, the, the, uh, the discussion went about uh, um, the, 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 the impact of digitalization in, uh, in times of COVID. And uh, from the research community, it was very positively noted that thanks to the fact that uh, <clears throat> mostly unhindered exchange of data on uh, on research, uh, on COVID research, that uh, this was really something to develop uh, uh, adequate uh, treatment, adequate uh, vaccines, adequate whatsoever in these times. So this is a, a very, well, it's just positive. So not just criticism, but mostly it works well. It's just, we just have to make sure it's not getting worse. Thank you, Jacques. Um, indeed, let's let's think about the benefits and what's at stake here, uh, and what is it that we can do um, to 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 maximize those benefits uh, that data flows bring, and try to address some of the challenges that the panel was really productive in in, in enumerating. Um, and I want to uh, turn to um, uh, Jose, who has a question here in the room um, as well. Um, says a related question, a young ambassador from the Internet Society. Um, would you like to take the microphone and ask your question or should I read it out? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, uh, okay. go ahead. Okay. Uh, so I just, um, I think Michael touched a little bit on this point, but I just wanted to hear the decision. But Jim, do you feel that it's been kind of a like a necessary approach that has rendered I mean as I know it's not that that, that old but has when like good results or is do you feel that there's more of a kind of like slowing that falls down and at the same time impacting like developing economy from important for economic development I just, it, but my question really is if you can have like a, just like a general view. Thank you. You were breaking up there for a second, but if um, I understand correctly, you would like to hear from the panel um, whether um, the GDPR has helped um, move along more trust around um, data flows um, or um, has itself been um, uh, a barrier to some of these data flows? Or uh, if I can add to your question, uh, has it been both or neither? Uh, Joe, your hand is up. And then we'll turn to Lee. Thank you very much. It's a, another great question. I think we, we need to acknowledge at the outset that there, there is a real trust deficit. There are real concerns about the security and privacy of information on, in digital networks, and that needs to be addressed. And the GDPR has been incredibly helpful in moving the ball forward to address that issue. But on the question of uh, data transfer mechanisms specifically, I'd, I'd like to um, harken back to a cop, um, comments that Michael had made. Um, two principles are especially important, being principle, the principle that data privacy frameworks should operate interoperably um, between uh, jurisdictions so that data can continue to flow. 
um, and so that it can flow with security and with responsibility. Uh, and then secondly, the accountability principle, i.e. That, that the protections associated with um, the, the jurisdiction from which the data originates will flow with the data is incredibly important. And then the last comment would just be um, adequacy is, is one mechanism. The GDPR outlines as well uh, binding corporate rules, standard contractual clauses, consent, and, and additional mechanisms that it would be helpful to explore, codes of conduct and certifications. Um, the other um, interesting model, I think, that um, will be increasingly important in the future are the APEC um, CDPR rules as well. Uh, so I think there's a very good framework for us to build upon in the future to ensure responsibility, um, security, and trust in data transfers in the future. Thank you, Jill. Um, I see uh, both um, Michael's and, and Lawrence's hand up. Um, sorry, Lee, I think the, the ones that I saw from you might have been a, an earlier um, hand up. So let me turn to Michael and then and then to Lawrence. Thank you. So this is a great question, and it's a question uh, that we encounter frequently in Canada as well. Uh, I would sort of, I'm going to argue it both ways, so sorry for taking the easy way out, uh, but I think that the GDPR has really, uh, in addition to all the benefits that we've already discussed about, has really sort of raised the profile of privacy as a as a question in many people's minds uh, and as, a, as something that's important to them as, you know, our economies become more digital and more connected. I'm sure like everyone in this you know, on this panel, I got a flurry of emails in my inbox when the GDPR came into force. And for me, it was expected because I knew it was happening, but a lot of my friends and colleagues had no idea what was going on. And it really, the GDPR was very successful in raising the profile of privacy, I think around the world and provided a very, um, good scheme to protect the privacy of individuals and sort of enable the flow of data in a very controlled way across borders. Now that said, uh, I can say from the Canadian perspective that the system uh, is fairly complex to people who, especially people who are not used to dealing with EU regulations. Uh, and in Canada in particular, the vast majority, like 98% of our businesses are small businesses and many of them are not well equipped to manage a sort of complex regulatory environment like this. And so in that case, um, things get a little more complicated. And I'm sure in particular for firms around the world in developing areas, this, this problem is the same. Um, you know, the rules are somewhat complex and uh, detailed. And if you're just sort of operating a pretty everyday business, it can be a complicated thing to adhere to. So I would say it's great. Uh, it offers many benefits, but at the same time, the degree of complexity it imposes uh, can be a challenge for, for some smaller firms in particular. Uh, so splitting it both ways. But I, you know, once again, for a little pitch for Pipita, the, the sort of less formal way might be a way that, um, and the less complicated way that Pipita kind of proposes might be an interesting uh, possibility that other states may want to consider uh, compared to a formal adequacy scheme, such as the one proposed by uh, the GDPR. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, my next on my list is Lawrence and then Norm, please. Yeah, so this is a great question. Um, and I think um, one of the panelists, I think it might've been Joseph, spoke a lot um, about what I was first gonna touch on, which is that it has been helpful. Um, it has raised a profile of privacy around the world. Um, and it's been a great um, initiator of this conversation. Um, in my experience, I'm seeing a lot of privacy laws around the world that are enacted um, pretty much verbatim based on um, GDPR, um, which is promising. Um, however, just to hark on one of the other things that we've talked about, which is, is data localization. Some of them um, create at times, um, or first let me back up a second. Um, GDPR does have alternate mechanisms. He talked about code of conduct, code of conduct, um, vital and in, in public interest, um, other mechanisms that are alternatives when another uh, the, the receiving country does not have an adequacy decision. Um, and those have been really important too. Um, uh, I, one, one, one thing that I know uh, from the US perspective is that um, sometimes adequacy decisions can take a long time. Um, and I, I think only a few countries do have adequacy from, from, um, from EU right now and, and more are growing, um, but it does take time. Um, and this can be a long time, especially for, for developing countries um, to, to, to access um, markets, 
or, or state-of-the-art tools and technology for expanding their, their SMEs, um, that, that uh, in that time could be uh, very important and critical to them being able to grow and expand. Um, also, um, it, 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 uh, it's, it's very important for them to have these alternate mechanisms because sometimes what we're seeing is that it'll just be an adequacy decision and no alternate mechanism, which results in a kind of de facto data localization um, uh, regime where it's saying, oh, you have to have adequacy decision or you have to have approval from a regulator, um, which can also take a long time and is um, uh, they're not clear cut rules on how you get these, these, these uh, uh, approval from the regulator. Um, so it results in this, this highly burdensome environment that can uh, add additional trade barriers or make it difficult um, for, for, for companies of all sizes, particularly small companies, to be able to navigate this kind of um, global regime. And so that's why um, regional frameworks, international frameworks, um, such as APEC, um, there, there's also um, within the CPTPP, um, uh, the, the understanding, the shared understanding that there will be um, uh, no restrictions um, on, on data flows within uh, member states. Um, and so these kinds of trade agreements um, where they're also supporting the principle of cross-border, free cross-border data flows are also very important. Um, so it, it's positive and there's also some, some, some things to, to fix, um, but um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thanks so much, Norm, over to you. Thanks to me. Um, like any new regulatory framework, I think there are, we're continuing to learn where the, the barriers are, but as a net positive, GDPR has clearly been a, an incredibly valuable um, addition to glo the global regulatory scheme. While it has likely slowed things down in terms of the development of the internet in the short term, as Michael pointed out, it has, sh it has shined a light on, on incredibly important issues. So we, we absolutely see it as, as a very positive development globally. At the same time, while it adds, in, in, in many ways, it, it adds complexity, it also tends to oversimplify the, the challenges of global data flows because an, an adequacy evaluation looks at these issues in a bilateral fashion one, you know, the EU to one country at a time. And, and as you can see on the internet, there's no such thing as a solely bilateral internet connection. The internet is interconnected globally and these are multilateral issues. And so that's why we are supportive of efforts like those in the OECD to bring together a, a broad multi-stakeholder uh, set of member states as well as industry to discuss, you know, what what are the the principles that should govern trusted government access to data, in in not just a bilateral fashion, but in a multilateral fashion. Thank you, and and that that note of um, sort of humility, I think, of of all of ours who think uh, we understand and have the solutions is is very welcome uh, from you, Norm. Here, it is an increasingly complex um, system with myriads of devices sharing data all across the world at every single um, step of the way. Sometimes. Um, with very different um, situations, uh, very different backgrounds, not just of the device, but of the user of the infrastructure as well. So there's a lot of variance in this equation that we need to consider. And, um, and I do want to get back to each and every one of you on the panel on, on how you feel, what is the environment that we need to create um, for ourselves to understand how this works? Um, what is the environment that we need to create for ourselves? Um, to understand what we can do um, to uh, help share our understanding uh, in, in of this um, increasingly complex system. Because finding a solution um, around um, increasing trust in data flows will, will inherently have a lot of hits and misses. Um, we will need to um, be able to test our responses the way we test our um, devices and technologies um, and there's going to be a lot of iteration so what are the kind of right policy elements to create um, an environment for, for these kinds of answers what is it that we can learn from 
other um, discussions that we've had, somebody mentioned the trade negotiations, is that something that uh, we can take as a, an example to, to apply here? Um, are there national uh, approaches like um, Michael mentioned that can be scaled up? What is it that we can take um, away as, as a springboard to, um, to start our global conversations around creating this uh, policy environment in which we enhance the trust in data flows. So um, I will want to turn to each of one of you in the panel with the same question, um, for what it is that we can take away as learnings. Um, and then uh, with the little time that we have left afterwards, uh, look into the audience and try and see if you have some of the parts of the solution. Because um, if I might say so uh, myself, I don't think we have the solution yet, but perhaps we can piece the pieces together. Um, so I'll start with Michael and then we'll do a round robin of the panel for the same question. Thanks very much. Um, so I would say speaking as a person who works for a national government, I think um, a couple things that uh, governments can do to promote cross-border data flows are to develop standardization strategies for data governance and also to encourage international collaboration. So we've all been discussing how data is an important resource that companies use to make them more productive and develop better products and services. And you know, as a result of the, the increasing use of that data, we need to figure out a way to sort of structure it, secure it, and, and govern it. Uh, in Canada, we had the discussion in 2019 at the Standard Councils of Canada uh, where we convened about 220 experts and stakeholders from across government, industry, and civil society to develop recommendations for clearly defined standardization strategies for data governance. And so that resulted in a roadmap uh, for standardization and provides a detailed description uh, in the Canadian context of the standardization landscape and made 35 recommendations to address gaps and explore new areas where standards and conformity um, assessments are needed. So from our perspective, we believe that the solutions we've identified in this roadmap will help Canada build a safer and more secure uh, digital infrastructure, which is founded on quality, trust, and ethics. I'll also note that in the Canadian budget of 2021, um, we have made an effort to further strengthen data governance and standardization, and the government of Canada is looking to create a data commissioner, uh, which will serve to inform our government uh, and businesses on data-driven issues and help protect people's personal data and encourage innovation in the digital marketplace. So we believe that this emphasis on data governance and standardization will help Canada support innovation and cybersecurity in our increasingly digital and online world. And it also provides a, a benefit to small and medium uh, firms who are a critical part of all of our economies. In Canada, they make up almost 98% of all businesses that operate here. And we want to ensure that as we move towards new data technologies and new digital ar architecture that we do so in a way that allows for these businesses to safely adopt to new, adapt rather, excuse me, to new security challenges. So with respect to international collaboration, uh, we certainly acknowledge that cross-border data flows are you know, increasingly important as we've all been discussing and an integral part of the digital economy. And Canada considers the preservation of the free flow of information across borders while maintaining privacy protection to be a, a very important strategic ob objective. So we participate in international fora, such as the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the Asia Pacific Economic Participation, and are actively engaged in initiatives that aim uh, at ensuring that there is interoperability across international rules for the protection of personal information in the context of trade. Uh, Canada's also included dedicated provisions in the e-commerce and digital trade chapters of recent trade agreements that we've negotiated on uh, cross-border data flows and data localization. And these include the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership and the Canada-US-Mexico Agreement. So it's to Canada's advantage uh, to ensure that international frameworks supporting e-commerce and cross-border trade are flexible and stay current with uh, the emerging digital business models, while at the same time ensuring an adequate level of protection for users and their data. And for jurisdictions where no privacy laws exist, we explore and promote the development of alternative solutions such as trust marks, codes of conduct, and adherence to standards. So for example, Canada is a participant in the APEC cross-border privacy rule system, uh, which is developed to reduce barriers to the flow of information within the Asia Pacific region by establishing a common set of rules. So for all these reasons, from a Canadian perspective, we feel that both standardization strategies for data governance and increased collaboration at the international level on privacy and data protection can help uh, promote the free flow of data across international borders. Thanks. 
That's that's great. So so Michael's piece to um, to the policy environment puzzle is standardization um, at home and interoperability of standards um, when we are thinking about uh, collaboration globally. So um, I'm noting that one as, as the first piece of the puzzle and and turning to to Lawrence to um, to add his. Hi. Um, yeah, I'd like to agree with um, a lot of what the presenters here have already said. Um, we've talked a lot about interoperability, um, ensuring that the frameworks that are written um, can be uh, are, are, are able to, to work within other frameworks that exist. Um, and a lot of people here have raised, or a lot of the, uh, the attendees have, have asked, and I attended a session um, that was focused on the free flow data with Africa, um, where uh, a lot of them are developing their first, um, are, are entering the the, the, the the digital economy or are going to be major players or currently are major players in the in digital economy. Um, and so having a, uh, a framework that is interoperable um, is going to be critical um, to, to, to not ensuring that they're not shutting themselves off um, from the global digital economy and other countries um, should look to do that as well. Um, we've talked about different regional frameworks such as um, APEC CBPR, um, which is which is a good framework um, to pull from and, and trade agreements. Um, and so, you know, we're supportive of having um, multi-stakeholder engagements um, like like this one, where we where we come and we discuss um, pulling people from private sector and public sector um, members of the public um, to talk about um, the, the the benefits of cross-border data flows um, and to to make people aware of um, the potential harms that can arise from um, from overly burdensome restrictions on data flows. Um, so, um, what's important is is ensuring a regional and international continuity, um, interoperability, um, and, and and making sure that we conduct um, truly multi stakeholder engagements um, and engage all members of society, um, and and make sure that uh, these frameworks, as we've said before, um, are not attempting to restrict or taking into account uh, the technical nature of the internet and how data flows all over the world um, in any every single minor interaction that we do have. Um, so it's, it's, it's important to have engagements with, with, with folks from all parts of society so that regulators do understand um, the implications, do understand the nature of, of, of technology. Um, and um, yeah, that, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thanks so much. So, so adding more pieces to the puzzle, uh, multi-stakeholder engagement, um, but informed multi-stakeholder engagement that is coupled with awareness raising um, that we know what we're talking about. We know what um, the data um, has potential and, and challenges are, but also um, that we know how this links with other layers of what we find and see in the internet. So not just the data layer, the content layer, but also um, the infrastructure and the actual uh, setup of, of the internet system. Um, piece, uh, pieces of the puzzle that is getting bigger. Um, so I'm curious what, what Norm has to add to it. Thanks to Mia. Um, I, I continue to come back to the, to the multi-stakeholder approach is, is so important and, and truly bringing in voices from a very broad range of expertise and interest to help guide principles in this area. Um, we've seen too often that the discussion, these discussions can get siloed with one set of, of, of experts or just a, a particular set of nations or a particular set of experts where you really need to bring in um, all the relevant voices, the privacy community, the law enforcement and national security community, trade officials, um, not just government officials, but also industry and experts from civil society uh, to, to discuss these issues and not let the debate get dominated by any one voice. And then start from what is the issue we are trying to solve? What is truly creating this trust deficit? We all, I think, agree that there is a trust deficit that is causing concern and, and raising artificial barriers to, to global data flows. But, but trying to zero in on, on what are the real um, what are the real causes of that trust deficit and then come up with principles that can that can hopefully guide a, a multi-stakeholder approach to, to defining the rules of road, providing clarity for citizens and, and businesses around the world. 
Um, and again, I, I, I do think that's that's one of the areas where organizations like this, the OECD and others, can be very helpful in, in bringing together that, that wide body of expertise. Thank you so much. So underlining the, the multi-stakeholder input, um, but not just stakeholder groups, but various branches of the same stakeholder group, if I could say so. Um, especially when we were discussing, as you um, noted before, uh, norm government access to, to private sector health data, um, who is around the table is, is not just government and the private sector, but the various branches of the government, as you said, um, that also goes into law, law enforcement, national security agencies and, and experts um, from the private sector's various parts um, as well. So um, hope to see that uh, that multi-stakeholder collaboration come together when we develop principles. Um, Turning um, to um, the uh, further panelists to answer our same questions and contribute their pieces to the um, to the answer puzzle, uh, Lee, how do you, how do you see? Uh, is there anything that you would like to add um, to this? Turn myself on here. Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's a very stimulating discussion, and I think a lot of what my fellow panelists have said is very rich and, and very useful to me. Uh, let me just hone in right on WTO. And if you talk about the principles uh, for both policy and regulation, um, the WTO has decades of experience in trying to get governments to agree to common uh, 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 policy and regulatory principles. But we also know it's extremely difficult. And our approach has a good side and a bad side. On the one hand, you, you have a common sets of principles and they're, 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 they're legally binding principles. On the other hand, we leave governments to their own devices to figure out how to implement those principles. And we hope we have the test of dispute settlement if somehow they're, they're, what they end up doing is not consistent. We have been very strongly sort of aware for decades that harmonization is not possible when you're dealing with many governments with different legal systems and different legal approaches. So this idea of, of interoperability is, is a very interesting one where things don't have to be identical, but they really have to work together and be moving in the same direction. Um, what I like to say is I'd like to see regulatory innovation being, being permitted. And I think the GDPR is a good example of, I think uh, Michael, I think was indicated that, is it a little too complex for some other markets to implement GDPR? Have they got all the right answers? I mean, there's even talk now within the EU of tinkering a little bit with GDPR. Another thing we can experience from the WTO is multiple governments could have this exact same law on the books and it could be implemented in completely different ways. In some cases, you know, very consistent with the principles of trade and in other cases, the exact same law could be implemented in an inconsistent way. My concern with GDPR is that complexity makes it very difficult to implement for many uh, developing countries. And so you will have it uh, sort of a pyrrhic victory if you have a law on the books that is just too difficult to implement. Moving to the discussions on um, e-commerce began in 1998 and have discussed things like not putting uh, customs duties. We had a moratorium that has continued up till this time, of uh, not putting customs duties on products transmitted electronically. Um, and then about four years ago, we started discussions on rules with a smaller group that would be rules and principles for um, online trade. Initially, we referred to it as e-commerce. Increasingly, we refer, refer to it as digital trade from the WTO's perspective of the de working definitions it used since 1998, digital trade and e-commerce are all covered and always were covered. Um, the, in those discussions. But one of the leading misconceptions that I see in the academic world and, and also sometimes in the uh, private sector is that we're creating new rules to cover trade that was never covered. Now, the data flows is specifically addressed in the new rules we're talking about, but it is totally inaccurate to say that a dis a di existing rules in the WTO, particularly 
the cross-border trade and services is not already covered. I think what you're seeing is a need to create some uh, clarity, create some specific ideas that can enhance the existing coverage and to some degree maybe expand how data flows are covered by the WTO rules. So I think it's important to remember that we've got a lot going already in the WTO. We have almost every dispute settlement case under the services agreement has related to something supplied online. So the dispute settlement system is capable of dealing with online activity, but it's never had to specifically address uh, a data flows question in its own right. Um, and hopefully, you know, it, it, governments can work to, to implement some consistent policies by working together. Now, I think it was interesting, the comment about the bilateral level. And in fact, I, I also wonder, is the bilateral level enough? What you're seeing though, is an interesting experiment in the WTO is to take what many governments have done bilaterally and bring it to the WTO. And I'd often thought maybe even beyond uh, digital trade, that would be an interesting idea in the WTO. But what I'm seeing is it still isn't easy, even when you have existing bilaterals to use as the raw material, it's still a very difficult process. Now, is it multi-stakeholder? In many respects, our process is multi-stakeholder by default. In just before the pandemic, when people were still coming in, in, in physically for, for meetings of the e-commerce negotiations, um, governments were bringing more and more delegates with them. Now, these were often a variety of government ministries, and I was very happy to see that so that, you, that they're clearly discussing. Um, before and during the pandemic, private sector and trade associations were coming forward, not officially participating, but um, providing knowledge seminars for the delegations. And, and there might be in a week when there was a meeting, two or three private sector seminars going on, which in some cases did include uh, um, um, some of the civil society. I think we have less of the civil society than we might want to see. Um, but you're never in the WTO going to have people sitting and negotiating. What governments do when they formulate their negotiating position is, you know, to try to coordinate with as many stakeholders as possible to formulate that position to bring to a WTO meeting. So I, I think that can also be a misconception that because they aren't sitting at the table, they aren't contributing very actively in many national governments. Now, um, what do we need? I think we need to make sure that we don't lock into solutions that might not in the long run uh, be adaptable to future technologies. We need to have regulatory innovation. Um, we need perhaps to use, uh, uh, permit some more of the regulatory sandbox kind of ideas. But I think that there needs to be much more multilateral cooperation. Now, the WTO can only go so far because if we relate to trade and even some things like cybersecurity, e-signatures, um, a variety of things that are trade related, but it's not easy to get cybersecurity experts at the WTO. I mean, that's not necessarily their job. It's not easy to get um, you know, uh, cyber crime experts to sit down uh, with WTO people, although a lot of what they do is extremely important for trust and, and, and by definition for trade. Um, I, I, I would like to know more myself about what multilateral collaboration may already be going on in areas like cyber crime and, and, and um, um, cyber security because I think they're equally as important as, as privacy in terms of ensuring that business and trade can function smoothly and, and by extension, make sure that economies can grow and develop. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you very much, Lee. A lot of food for thought there, both in refining some of what the other panelists have said um, and moving, moving ahead together, but that doesn't mean um, that uh, we have to have the same uh, regulation, but have interoperable regulation and policy um, considerations. 
um, that where we keep in mind also implementation um, so that we move ahead, not just with the same direction of principles, but the same direction of implementation as well, um, to think forward um, in our um, approaches. So um, have our approaches be flexible and, and future-proof as much as possible. Um, and of course, um, to have multi-stakeholder input, not just when we are at the table at international conversations, but also at home, so we ensure that positions are informed. So that's all very well noted. Um, let me turn to uh, Joe uh, now to, to add your, your two, two cents into, into our growing policy puzzle here. Uh, and then I'm looking at uh, Galia who will have a very difficult job in uh, <laughs> um, contributing and, and summarizing uh, uh, this. So I'm um, just uh, signaling ahead that I would also like to hear about how the OECD um, is taking these advices on board for your um, projects. So uh, Joe first for your two cents and then Galia for the last word. Great, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'd like to essentially echo all of the prior comments and endorse them. Um, but maybe to, to sum up a couple of points, one is underscoring the, the critical nature of interoperability and avoiding a siloed approach and ensuring a future-proof approach. Um, when it comes to some of the specific data regulatory or um, international data regulatory um, initiatives, the OECD's uh, focus on trusted government access in, in the law enforcement context, uh, privacy related discussions, cybersecurity related discussions. Um, those are very important to continue um, among experts in those specific fields. But then it's also, I think, important and useful for us to uh, think about some type of a reaffirmation of what the broader international uh, economic um, legal framework, the umbrella framework, is uh, that, that guides and binds um, core principles across all of those different uh, areas. And to echo one of one of Lee's comments, it's absolutely correct that um, core WTO disciplines already do apply to data data transfers uh, under uh, cross border data. I'm sorry, cross border trade and services disciplines under the GATS. But a but a clarification that makes clear um, that in whatever area of regulation. Countries will abide by principles of non-discrimination, uh, will abide by principles of avoiding disguised restrictions on trade, that uh, regulation will be um, necessary. Those types of clarifications um, as, as it relates kind of broadly to data regulation would be quite useful. It would be useful in the specific context of law enforcement access, privacy and uh, cybersecurity that we just mentioned. Um, and uh, it, it would be useful for future proofing and providing touchstones. And one other comment, I guess, again, this, this does bring it back to the WTO, but WTO has um, experience going back decades in uh, you know, providing these bro you know, broad principled framework uh, uh, for the interface uh, between trade and environmental regulation, trade and standards, trade and licensing rules, trade and IP and customs. Um, so there is a broad international framework that has been tested and developed over decades uh, that, that would be useful to reaffirm, where it would be useful to reaffirm core principles. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, and our last panelist for today, we've started with you, we're ending with you. Um, what are the, the two cents uh, uh, around the policy um, solutions that you see are, are the most important? And, and how does the OECD take some of this on board when you think about um, policy advice? Thank you very much, Timea, and, and thanks to all the panelists for the really rich discussion. Um, it's a bit sort of stressful to try to, to summarize that or sort of to, to maybe to say something new, but I think I. I mean, obviously, I, I fully echo the, all the elements that the other panelists identified, and I think sort of some of the things that I heard and that really reflect, I think, the way that the OECD works sort of by nature um, are the importance of the multilateral discussion, of the multi-stakeholder participation, um, and, and also sort of the, of the evidence base that, that sort of supports us in identifying uh, through the, this multi-stakeholder input, um, identifying the, the, the best practices 
um, that sort of are the basis for the, for the guidance or for principles uh, around this area of, of cross-border data flows. Um, so I think maybe just to give sort of two examples of, of concrete um, projects that the OECD has undertaken in, in this area. So uh, one example is the recently adopted OECD recommendation on enhancing access and sharing of data. Uh, this recommendation was adopted uh, by OECD countries in, in October, um, earlier this year, um, and has a section that sort of relates to cross-border data flows and, and provides sort of three main recommendations. Um, one about minimizing the, the barriers to, to cross-border data flows, one about sort of the elements of and, and sort of focusing on legitimate uh, needs around that, and uh, one is concerns the what, what elements these restrictions need to, to follow. So they need to be non-discriminatory. Um, they need to be transparent. They need to be uh, necessary and, and proportionate. And one around the importance of international dialogue around this area. And then a second project that I'll mention and, and, and that Norm has touched upon and, and Timea, you, you as well, um, is our ongoing work on government access to uh, personal data held by the private sector. Um, and this this work is ongoing, but but I think it sort of it looks into a particular area of of trust deficit in, in cross border data flows and, and and sort of try to fill in this international gap uh, by looking at uh, what is common around countries so that we can promote trust around that. And sort of one thing that I can say is that uh, we have already identified a lot of commonalities around this. Um, and another thing in that sort of to echo what uh, Norm has said earlier is the importance of sort of this, this cross-disciplinary um, dialogue around this area. And so this echoes some of Lee's comments earlier, but so we bring together um, and, and also in our uh, broader project on data, um, data governance, but what we bring together uh, experts from privacy, uh, from national security, uh, from law enforcement, and, and have this, this cross-cutting dialogue uh, together. Um, I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Galia, and thank you to everyone who's contributed your your thoughts um, to your to your really rich to this really rich discussion. Um, I wish I had a magic button I can I can push now to um, to make uh, a really quick summary and and come up with the ideal solution for us uh, going forward. I unfortunately don't have that. What I do have is a trusted rapporteur um, in the person of Ben Wallace, um, who I'm going. To approve the cloud first policy um, for for the public sector and actually we followed also the recommendation from OECD to to be a digital by design government uh, all our services should be th thought uh, previously on to be online and and we have been doing this boot camp so that our public officers can uh, build this trust that uh, Mr. Barbosa mentioned. There is a trust deficit actually in my country, in Peru. Um, and even when we have a personal data protection law, um, actually a very good one that allows um, data flows, if data, data transfers, right? We also have a cloud first policy we still find that there, there are some myths around the public officers. And I would like to ask what is your recommendation? Because I don't think it's only policy, because we already have that. Um, it's, is that something that we can do um, in a multi stakeholder way to, to bring this trust we need? Because I think there is a gap. Maybe I don't know if you have some thoughts or anyone has best practice no, not... with us. I believe we, we might not. To as panelists have said, not just around uh, what we need to do in policy, but also around how the internet works, how data flows work, what are the benefits that we all enjoy, how the, how the flows themselves, how the internet setup at the different layers 
um, contributes to, to that and what is really, as the title of this session says, what's at stake if, if, we, uh, if we lose that. So um, I, that would be my two cents. Uh, if anybody in the room would like to contribute to that, um, thank you very much uh, to, for saying that. And uh, we can stay in touch, as I said, online. Um, please tag at ICCWBO um, to your comments and we will respond uh, and um, make the connections. Um, and with that, um, thank you again, everyone, for participating here and online. Um, we've had almost around 100 people connect um, um, together here in the room uh, from Katowice and from every part of the world um, online. So thank you for this um, amazing discussion. We will share the summary um, and I'm looking forward to continuing our conversation at the next IGF and in between. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you.